Good morning. Hi, Edward. And that was Jessica greeting you. Um, hope your trip to China went well. We're going to start Unit 8. The Unit 8 test is a week from Friday. You have the problem set in front of you, so take a look at the problem set. 20 problems, the answer's on the back. You might want to pace yourselves on that. And uh, yeah, so let's get started. Now, if you want paper notes for today's lesson, I've got them up at the table by the door, so we're coming down. We're starting our unit on sequences and series. Unit eight is sequences and series. We're gonna to test to see whether a series converges or diverges. This is widely considered to be the most challenging unit in calculus. So take a look at my fingers. It's like a typical calculus unit is this difficult, like unit one, two, three. But unit eight, it's like this difficult. It's like a little bit of an extra push. It's not like, you know, off the top of the screen difficult. It's just, it's a little bit more. But I'm confident that if you simply, if you simply like just come to class ready to go, you'll be just fine because uh, in fact, the homework that's due tomorrow, homework that's due on block day, is actually significantly shorter than many of the homeworks that we've had so far in terms of the amount of time that it will take for you to complete. So this is an introductory unit. Here we go for an introductory lesson. Sequences, series, and the harmonic series is what we're looking at today. We're going to talk about the concept of a partial sum, and we'll learn two of the ten tests for convergence. Um, today and this will spill into block day. So the nth term test, even though it won't be on the homework that's due tomorrow, it, it will be in this lesson. This is kind of like a, a larger concept lesson than what you need on the homework. But this will get you ready for the homework. So test one is the nth term test that will be in this lesson. We're going to test a series to see if it converges or diverges and also teach you the geometric series test. So why would it matter whether a series converges or diverges? I'd like you to take out your graphing calculator. Let's just get a visual introduction to what's going on in this unit on series. So go ahead and check your mode. Make sure that you're in radiant mode. And go to the viewing window. And please join me by going from negative 2 pi to 2 pi for x min x max. Negative 2 pi to 2 pi with an x scale of pi over 2. Or approximately negative 6.28 to positive 6.28 by pi over 2. And on the y-axis, let's go from negative 2 to 2 by 1s. That's Negative 2 to 2 by 1s for y min and y max. And go to your y equals menu and please type in for y1 sin x. So here's what the sin x graph should look like. It's two full periods from negative 2 pi to positive 2 pi. And we can use series to approximate all sorts of non-polynomial functions. Series are going to be polynomials. We're going to be able to use non-polynomial functions to approximate. We're going to be able to use polynomial series to approximate non-polynomials. For example, take a look at, I should have had that up there in y1. I'm going to put it up there. So for y1 is sine x. For y2, just type in the polynomial x. And notice that x is a pretty nifty approximation of sine x, at least in the vicinity of zero. Like if you go out, maybe you're willing to go out maybe pi over four in either direction. X is a polynomial that approximates, excuse me, sine x. In fact, let's give another polynomial that's an even better approximation. Consider the polynomial x, type this in, x minus 1 sixth of x cubed. That's x cubed over 3 factorial. Remember, 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1. 3! It's 3 times 2 times 1. Check this bit. 
X is okay, but look at, oh, X cubed or X minus X cubed over three factorial is an even better fit for sine X. And let's take a more advanced polynomial. I'm just going to clear out that one. We're just going to focus on a polynomial that fits very nicely. X minus 1, 6, X to the third plus, let's add one more term to this. Um, 1 over 5 factorial. 5 factorial is 120. So 1 divided by 120 times x to the fifth. Notice this is an alternating series. The first term is positive. It alternates to negative for the second term, alternates to positive for the third term. This is um, an even better fit. Check this out. We're getting a polynomial that fits a sine curve. And the beauty of a unit in calculus on series is that we can reduce hard math problems to adding. As long as you can add, that's what we're doing, first term plus the second term plus the third term. Something as mysterious as sine x can be broken down into a sum. Subtraction is adding the opposite. By the way, a slightly easier way to see the pattern that's going on here Instead of 1, 6, it's really 1 over 3 factorial x to the third. And the factorial button, I'm going to have to go to insert, so second insert. The factorial button is on the math probability submenu, item 4. So it's 1 over 3 factorial x to the third. 120 is 5 factorial, so 5 math probability submenu, item 4, delete, gives us that one. Now, um, does anyone have an idea of what the next term is going to be, which will give us an even better fitting polynomial to non-polynomial sine x max? Is it minus 1 over 7 factorial x to the 7? 1 divided by 7 factorial, go to math probability item 4, times x to the 7th. Let's see if that's an even better fit of a polynomial to non-polynomial sine x. Here we go. Uh, wow, it just keeps getting better. That's a finite series. The infinite series is actually exactly equal to sine x. Um, I was approached by, you know, I think we can do better with the color here. And I'd like to go red. I think red would show up better overseas. Um, does anyone know how to change the color? Let's see. Oh, something happened there. That was the actual color. Sorry, Edward. No, this is taking a long time. I just wish I knew how to. There. Oh, no. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if it's my stylus or. The software. Do I have to use the like arrow on the like calculator button pad thing? Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. How how do people know these things? Okay, so now it's red. That's what I wanted. I want red. And okay, so now okay. Press enter on the calculator thing on your screen. Or maybe like here. Enter, enter. All right, so now when I press grab, all that just to get the vivid contrast between the polynomial function in red and the non-polynomial function in blue. So just a little story. One time I was uh, approached by Mr. Luz, L-U-Z. Shakar Luz was a calculus student of mine back in 1998. And uh, he came up after class and said, Mr. Roy's, can my dad come and talk to you? I said, okay. <laughs> and so I set up a meeting with Mr. Luz, spelled L-U-Z. Turned out to be one of the patent holders at Motorola for the cell phone back then. And he said that at Motorola, his superiors were asking him to try to take 
cell phone technology from analog to digital. Or in other words, they wanted to be able to take a curve, let's say a curve that represented someone's voice and represent it as a sequence of numbers that are added together so that sound could be represented digitally. And there's something that he learned back in units eight and nine of calculus that he knew he needed to know whether or not his approximation would converge or lock in to the sound quality standards of Motorola. Because again, this is just an approximation. The red curve is just an approximation of the blue curve, but it is a pretty good approximation. The better the digital approximation, the, be the better the approximation that this curve is of that non-polynomial curve, the better it'll sound on the phone. And so I took him through that. I reviewed with him some of the things that we learned in BC calculus in units eight and nine, the two units that we're in. And he said, oh, thank you. And then I told my students afterwards, they said, Mr. Royce, did you negotiate for a percentage of cell phone sales by Motorola in perpetuity? I said, no, but in a way I was paid not in United States dollars. I was paid in a different form of currency. The currency that I'm receiving right now when I get to show students the window so that you can see how calculus is used in the third millennium. Calculus is not just a thing for back in, you know, 1666 and 1667 when it was discovered by Isaac Newton but it's used by the technology engineers, the phone engineers of today. Let's learn about sequences and series. Here we go. So we're on page one. When you see that symbol right there, the pointy braces, that means US dollars are overrated. Um, <laughs> means sequence. And we're gonna go in blue can be seen in China sequence on YouTube. Now, YouTube's not allowed in China, but um, really? there's, you've heard of the Great Wall of China. There's the Great Firewall of China. And I've heard that there are ways, not legal ways, but there are ways to leap over the wall. Not, not that we're planning to do that here <laughs> in this video. All about staying within the law. Now, um, especially international law. Now, um, sequence. So the pointy braces means sequence. When you see the sigma, that means you're talking about a series. So we're studying sequences and series. A sequence can either converge, happiness, the convergence that executives at Motorola are happy, or it can diverge, which means it doesn't fit, it shoots off to infinity or just fails to lock in, and the sound quality is terrible when you have a divergent sequence or series. So a sequence can either converge or diverge, and a series can either converge or diverge. To diverge simply means to not converge. We've already had an introduction to that terminology, but what is a sequence? Do anyone know what a sequence is? In exactly four words, how would you define the sequence? I know what it is. It's a list of terms. A list of terms. The terms can be geometric in nature or numeric. In calculus, we usually deal with numeric terms, but they could be geometric or they could even be non-mathematical. They could be, you know, people. What's the difference between a sequence and a series? Yeah, Max. Is a series like the sum of a sequence? Yeah. If you have a sequence, which is a list of terms separated by commas, if you want to turn a sequence into a series, just replace all of the commas that separate the terms with plus signs. So here's the long and short of it. To turn a sequence into a series, replace the commas, which separate the items in the list with plus signs. To turn a sequence into a series, replace the commas 
with plus signs. All right, so a series is the sum of a sequence. Now, um, some books use T for the nth term. Our book tends to use the letter A for the nth term. But basically, whether they use A or N, a term in a series, whether it's T sub N or A sub N, or it could be B sub N, is basically a function of N. So these terms in the series are really outputs of a function whose input is n. So there's many ways to represent sequences in series, but one of them is to put the formula for the nth term of the sequence in pointy braces. So that would mean um, a1, and by the way, this function of n has a domain of the counting numbers. So n represents a counting number, generally starts at 1. Sometimes it's a whole number. So um, n is a natural, sometimes whole, but usually a natural variable. So when you see a sub n, that means we're taking the first term as a sub 1, because when the input is 1, the output is f of 1 or a sub 1, comma, a sub 2, comma, a sub 3, comma, dot, 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 comma, a sub n, comma, dot, dot, dot. So a sub n might be 1 over n or n squared, or n cubed. a sub n is just some function of n. And a function is a rule which assigns each input to exactly one output. That's what a function is. A function is simply a rule. Now when you see sigma a sub n, that doesn't mean sequence a sub n, it means series a sub n. So when I say go, I'd like you to say sequence a sub n. Ready? Go. Sequence, sequence a, a sub n. n. Now say series a sub n. Ready, go. Series. And to turn a sequence into a series, you simply replace the commas with plus signs. So it's going to be A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus dot, 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 plus A sub n is the nth term plus dot, dot, dot. It's in, if there's no lower and upper limits of summation indicated, then the default values are from n equals 1 to infinity. If they want you to think of other values, then they'll write them down. But the default values of the indices of summation are 1 and infinity. So um, summation from, yeah. So this really means the same thing as that. It's just that here they've actually put the default, that they've specified the default values. But it's basically some function where 1 is the input, a of 1, a sub 1 is the output, f of 2 means a sub 2, so they mean the same thing. But what if they want to start not at the customary index of summation, the lower limit of summation is customarily 1, but if they want you to start at 0, then they'll tell you that, a0 plus a1 plus a2 plus dot 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 plus a sub n plus dot, dot, dot. So they might want you to start at 5. So that would be a5 plus a6, etc. a5 plus a6 plus a7 plus dot, dot, dot. Now, in the harmonic series, that's the most famous of all series um, on planet Earth. It's not just Western civilization. It's on both sides of the wall. It's um, most famous series of all is 1 over n. The harmonic series is 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fourth. Notice the rule for the nth term of the sequence is 1 over the input. And the output is the term in sequence. Add up the terms in the sequence, you get a series. So the harmonic series is 1 fifth plus dot, dot, dot. Now, does the harmonic series converge or diverge? Or, in other words, if you look at the sequence of partial sums, just to bring in the partial sum notation, the first partial sum is 1, by the way. That's just the summation from n equals 1 to 1. The second partial sum, write these in the margin. S2 means the summation from n equals 1 to 2. It's 1 plus a half. The third partial sum 
is the sum of the first three terms, one plus a half plus a third. As goes the sequence of partial sums, so goes the series. Let's write that down. That's actually, that's how you can tell whether a series converges or diverges at a very fundamental level without using any of the 10 tests. Here's the basic idea. As goes, this is a very important vocabulary, the sequence of partial sums. So goes the series. So if the sequence of partial sums is converging, then the series converges. If the sequence of partial sums diverges, then the series diverges. So goes the series. So it's the most basic idea for this whole unit where the whole focus is, here's a series. Does it converge or does it diverge? Well, the most basic way to answer that question is, well, let's look at the sequence of partial sums. If the sequence of partial sums is exploding to infinity, then the series is going to explode or diverge to infinity. But if the sequence of partial sums is getting closer and closer to 3, then the series is going to converge to 3. You're all familiar with series that converge. Like, for example, 0.9 repeating is a series. It's 0 0.9 plus 0 0.09. You don't have to write this down. You're familiar with it from when you were a little kid. So what's the sequence of partial sums? The first partial sum is 0 0.9. The sum of the first two terms is 0.99. What's the third partial sum of 0.9 repeating? Class? 0.999. So what's the nth partial sum? Well, close. No. It's um, 0.999 with n nines. It's not 0.9 repeating yet. S is the infinite sum. S is the limit as n approaches infinity of the nth partial sum. And that's point nine repeating, which is 1. So this sequence of partial sums converges to 1, and therefore the series converges to 1. What's this thing doing? 1 plus 1.5 plus, use your calculator, what's, uh, you know what, let's write a home screen program for this that generates this. I want to show you, home screen programs for Euler's method are similar to home screen programs for series, but they are a little bit different. Um, how about we just look at the sequence of partial sums and join me now in the home screen. Now, for sequences, we just want to start n at 0. 0, store, n. <coughs> Go ahead and type a 0 in for n. Kennedy, I'd like you to join in on this. If you give me a phone, I'll give you a calculator. Everyone should have a calculator. Everyone participates in mathematics. Oh, do you have a calculator? No. OK, go and bring your phone up quickly. Bring your phone up. Give me a calculator. Everyone gets to play. Do you own a calculator? Uh, I left it in New York, so it's getting mailed back to me. You only in New York? Yeah. I was in New York. Actually, bring it to class. I math in New York? Because I have math homework in New York. All right, back to the show. Now, zero store n. Now, <laughs> we're going to update n, and we're going to update a, which is 1 over n. And back to, actually, let's look at the sequence of partial sums. I mean, I um, just want to show you the difference between a home screen program for a sequence and a home screen program for a sequence of partial sums. If all you want is the sequence, then check this out. Um, we've got n is the input, a is the output, and unlike Euler's method where we always updated the output and then the input, we did y plus delta y store y, y plus dy store y, and then we did x plus dx store x. We don't have to go backwards. With the sequence, it's just going to be n plus 1 store n. So n plus 1 store n colon. And then 
A is going to be uh, um, 1 divided by n store A. So n is always one more than the previous one, and the nth term is just going to be A colon pointy brace n comma a, so alpha n comma alpha a. This will give us just the sequence. It's not a sequence of partial sums, it's a sequence. Notice when you press enter, the first term is 1, second term is 1 half. Oh, you know what, let's do, let's go math 1. Let's uh, put it in fraction. So the third term is a third, the fourth term is a fourth, the fifth term is a fifth. So when the input is 8, the output is 1 8th, because the rule is 1 over input. So that's just something that you don't really need a calculator for. But it is nice to be able to tell the calculator, give it this three-step loop that every time you press enter, the calculator executes all three commands, and you just keep going. Now, that's not going to, I mean, that tells us that the nth term, the nth term is going to converge to zero. So this sequence converges. The sequence converges to zero because the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over n is what? Class, what's the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over n? What? Zero. Yeah, it's in the form 1 over infinity, which is zero. So the sequence converges to zero. But what does the series do? To find out what the series does, you have to look at the sequence of partial sums. Now, so now, here's one you want to write down. Let's write down this, the sequence of partial sums home screen program. Let's put zero back in for n, zero, store, n, enter. So let's initialize the value of n. And let's initialize the value of s, zero, store, s, which is the value of the series. Now, s is going to be a partial sum. So here we go n plus 1 store n. So it's alpha n plus 1 store n colon. Now let's update the nth partial sum. The nth partial sum is the previous partial sum. It always starts out at 0. And then we're going to add the nth term. So s plus the nth term is 1 over n. So it's basically s plus a sub n. In this case, a sub n is 1 over n. That's going to be the new s, store alpha s. So the structure here is easy to remember because it's update the input, update the output, display the ordered pair as alpha n comma alpha s, and math 1 convert frac. Now, this is going to give us a sequence of partial sums. As goes the sequence of partial sums, so goes what? The series. The series. So you want to know what the series does? Is this thing going to go off to infinity or go to what? First of all, stop before you press enter. How many of you, your gut is telling you this thing is going to, the sequence of partial sums is going to top out somewhere? Kind of like 0.9 repeating tops out at 1. How many of you are thinking that? Raise your hand. By the way, Edward, raise your hand or don't raise your hand. How many of you think the harmonic series converges? Thanks, you can put your hands down. Raise your hand if you think it diverges. You have to go with one or the other. Moose? So, do you think it's going to go off to infinity? Uh, yeah. That's what you think. Oh, that's interesting. So, um, so, Edward, just FYI, uh, it was the only people who think this thing is going to diverge is... Jenny, Moose, and Rapunzel. Everyone else think it's think it's going to converge. Let's find out. Does this make sense? The second partial sum is one plus a half. One plus a half. Third partial sum is one plus a half plus a third, which is eleven six. Fourth partial sum is one plus a half plus a third plus a fourth. And now press enter repeatedly. As goes the sequence of partial sums, so goes the series. Those of you who thought it was going to top out at 2, it's already up to 4.39.
Press enter repeatedly. Don't stop pressing enter. Don't stop. It's all the way up to five. It broke through five. The 89th partial sum, the sum of the first 89 terms of the series is 5.07. And it'll never stop. It'll break through every barrier. It'll break through 100, 1,000, a million. The harmonic series diverges. The harmonic series diverges. We haven't proved it yet. I can prove, I can prove it for you today if you'd like. Do you want to see the proof that the harmonic series diverges? No. Nope. It's part of the lesson. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> This is counterintuitive. So this is, again, this is big progress. So what progress, I mean, what we've learned today is that if you're looking for a reliable source of truth, it's not you. Because your heart lies to you. Your heart tells you things like, the harmonic series converges. No, it diverges. And here's, a, you know, this is a big progress, big progress, because now, now you found out if you're looking for a reliable source of truth, look somewhere else. But what if you're one of them? Then, then, you th then they're not yet heart. to that point. You know, they, they haven't, their, their heart didn't lie to them today, but it will, so, I mean, <laughs> the, 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 heart, the heart will always lie eventually. No, it's just that today's not their day. <laughs> what? I'm sorry, today's not your day. Your heart told you the truth. Stop <laughs> pressing enter. Okay. What do you add? Yeah, those of you who have lost the ability to tell your finger to stop pressing enter, there is hope for you. We do. There are people who specialize in repairing overused enter buttons, and they uh, charge less than two hundred dollars an hour to replace your enter button with one that functions. How long does it take to calculate? Yeah, this is really hard to me, right? All right, here we go. So, does, okay, the harmonic series diverges. Page two. On page two, let's look at a proof that the harmonic series diverges. Now, we've just learned improper integrals. And one thing we learned when we were doing improper integrals is that this, there's actually a relationship between this improper integral and the harmonic series. Go ahead and take a few moments to review what you learned about evaluating an improper integral. Would you please find the limit, or rather, yeah, well, let's just call it the limit as A approaches infinity of the integral from 1 to A of 1 over x dx. So, class, go ahead and evaluate the definite integral. Okay, this one's not too bad. The, uh, you have to figure out what the limit as A approaches infinity of natural log A is. Minus natural log one, but natural log one is zero. Now, those of you who have graphical intelligence know that the natural log X graph goes slowly, just like the calculator program that's generating a sequence of partial sums is, is slowly breaking through boundaries like four, five, six, Seven. It's not going quickly, but it will break through any upper bound. It's diverging to infinity in the same way that the harmonic series diverges to infinity. You are seeing with your home screen program that the sequence of partial sums is slowly rising to infinity. But how do we know it's slowly rising to infinity? How, do we, how can we prove it's not going to top out at 10 or 11 or 40? Because it's going to be, you, you don't have, you, your lifetime is probably not long enough to keep pressing enter until it breaks through 500 or 600. It takes a long time to break through. Let's prove that it will eventually break through every boundary without devoting the rest of our days to pressing enter. So here we go. Can I have any muscles? What does... This is a P class. What does the harmonic series have to do with this problem? Well, I want to show you the relationship between the harmonic series and this calculus problem. 1 over x from 1 to infinity, draw the curve 1 over x, or at least the branch of this hyperbola that's in quadrant 1. This is the 1 over x curve, 
and from one to infinity at one, I'd like you to draw a rectangle. And this rectangle has a length of one and a width of one, and the area of this rectangle is one. It's one times one. Now, draw this next rectangle. All of these rectangles will have a width of one and a length of one over x. <clears throat> so this is a one by one half, or area of that rectangle is one half. Next rectangle is one by one third, or one third. Notice that the areas of the rectangles are the terms in the harmonic series. Do you see the connection there? So also notice that the integral from one to infinity is related how to the sum of the areas of the rectangles. Because of the overhang, every rectangle hangs over because the derivative of one over x is negative. You know that's going to be a de it's a decreasing function, so there's always going to be overhang. Notice how one plus a half plus a third, one plus one half plus one third plus dot 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 forever, is actually because of the overhang. It's greater than the integral from one to infinity of one over x dx. And since the integral from one to infinity of one over x dx is infinity, the harmonic series is even bigger than infinity due to the overhang. The harmonic series diverges. The summation from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n is bigger than infinity. Not all infinities have the same size. You already knew this because there's an infinite number of numbers between 1 and 2. There's also an infinite number of numbers between 2 and a million. Some infinities are, or have a higher order than, or are bigger than others. So the infinity of the infinite of the harmonic series is bigger than the infinity, the infinite area under the curve one over x one from one to infinity. So there you see a nice connection between our previous unit and this unit. Any questions as to how it is we can prove that the harmonic series diverges using improper integrals? So, which partial sum are you on now, Jessica? Um, 452. The 452nd partial sum. You've pressed enter 452 times. And what is the 452nd partial sum approximately? 6.69. So, 6.69. So maybe some maybe sometime this week you'll actually, you know, break through the 8 barrier <laughs> on your way to infinity. Have fun with that. Okay? So, let's take a look at partial sums. S is the symbol we use for an infinite series. S sub n is a partial sum of an infinite series. So S can be represented by A, A1 plus A2 plus dot, dot, dot forever. S1 just means A1. S2 means A1 plus A2. S3 is A1 plus A2 plus A3. These are um, partial sums. The nth partial sum is a1 plus a2, switching to blue, okay, so the nth partial sum, it's a mouthful, I don't want to uh, tongue tie, you want to say, oh, I'd like you to say out loud and in unison, the nth partial sum, ready, go. The nth partial sum is a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus dot 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 plus a sub n. Now, as goes the sequence of partial sums, so goes the series. So this is a sequence of partial sums. Sequence S of n is a sequence of partial sums. Very important concept. That's a foundational concept in, in this unit. The 90th partial sum is the 89th partial sum plus what? Who can tell me what symbol to put in here? This is for any series. The 90th partial sum, yes. Go ahead. A, A sub 90. 89th partial sum plus the 90th term gives you the 90th partial sum. So you can think of the sequence of partial sums as S1, comma, S2, comma. And that's what the home screen program generated for you. Today we wrote a home screen program that generates a sequence of partial sums. S3, comma, S4, comma, dot, 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 comma, S of n, comma, and I wouldn't even go dot, dot, dot. 
because n is going off to infinity. So, now, number four is one plus, here's, here's a series. It's a series one plus two plus four plus eight plus dot, 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 where the formula for the nth term is two to the n minus one. Check it out, when n equals one, a sub n is one. When n equals two, two minus one is one. So the second term in the sequence is two, so the second term in the series is two. Two to the squared, two to the third, two to the fourth, two to the fourth. So what's the sequence of partial sums? Well, the first partial sum is one. What is the second partial sum, class? Call it out. Let them hear you way over there. Three. Three. Keep going. Seven. Seven. Fifteen. Oh, by the way, do you notice a pattern in the sequence of partial sums? It's a big part of mathematics is looking for patterns in sequences of partial sums. What do you notice about these numbers? They're actually next door neighbors of very famous numbers. They all live next door to some very famous numbers. They're next door neighbors of the powers of two. Two to the first, two squared, two cubed, two to the fourth, they're all minus one. So it's two to the n minus one. Look, the nth term of the sequence is two to the n minus one, but the n partial sum is two to the n minus one. It's not two to the n minus one, it's two to the n minus one. So this formula for the nth partial sum tells you what the series is going to do. Because if the nth partial sum, just take the limit. Friends, big equation, the equation of the day, s equals the limit as n approaches infinity of the nth partial sum. You want to know what a series does? Take the limit as n approaches infinity of the nth partial sum. Notice that the limit as n approaches infinity of 2 to the n minus 1. Woo, that goes to infinity. So this series, no question, it diverges. This thing quickly diverges. It's not like, oh, my heart tells me that it converges. No, this thing very clearly diverges. Point 0.9 repeating. Uh, we saw this one already. Sequence of partial sums is 0.9, 0.99. Comma, point nine nine nine, comma, dot, 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 comma, goes off. So anyway, limit is limit as n approaches infinity of s of n equals s, which is the summation of a sub n. So we're learning new symbols today. The, the series is the limit of the nth partial sum. When I say go, I'd like you to say out loud and in unison, the value of the series is the limit as n approaches infinity of the nth partial sum. Ready? Go. The value of the series is the limit as n approaches infinity of the nth partial sum. Now, um, just a comment here. Turn the page. Um, so definition of convergent and divergent series. We'll hit that on block day. But I do want you to see a couple of things here on the uh, debugging programs here. So if you're looking for, and we did this earlier, but now here it is documented. If you're looking for a program that will generate this, notice that to debug it, don't start at one, do zero store in. So there is a, a problem on the homework that's due tomorrow that requires that you write a home screen program. So, just understand it's going to be zero store n, and then one n plus one store n, colon, one over n store, they're doing t, we did a, colon, n comma a. So in case you did not write down that program earlier today, I just want to make sure you have a copy of it. So, um, I'm going to fill in this one here and also post these notes for you in case you want to refer to it. The homework. 8.1 is due tomorrow. You are dismissed. 8.1, due tomorrow.